Hello there, my name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Few could deny the explosion in popularity of trout fishing brought about by the stocking of rainbow trout into the Midlands' big drinking reservoirs back in the 1970s, then inviting the angling public, at a price, to come along and pull them out again. The knock-on effect of this turned into lots of smaller put-and-take trout fisheries also offering stocky bashing, and in some cases, specifically bred monsters and even ready-made records to be caught on the day of their introduction, to start popping up all over the place. And the rest, as they say, is history. Or is it? Because historically, the rainbow trout does not belong here in the UK, which has a tradition of indigenous brown trout dating way back to the disappearance of the ice fields at the close of the last glacial period, around 7,000 years ago. But now it seems the rainbow trout is king, though not for everybody. For there are still a few dedicated anglers out there who prefer the fish to be natural, and dare I say British, even if that does mean that the growth potential is equally going to be natural, linked directly to the productivity of whatever water they find themselves in, which if that isn't a chalk stream stuffed to the brim with nutritious invertebrates, is often going to mean fish weighing in at less than a pound. On the other hand, our indigenous brown trout are very discerning wily animals, offering a level of challenge and demanding a level of watercraft that no force-fed rainbow trout can ever hope to match, with a cult following as a result. One person who very passionately believes in the merits of that cult status is author, brown trout expert and former Wild Trout Trust chairman Mike Weaver, MBE. So what is it then about indigenous wild trout, as opposed to facility rear imports, that makes you sit up and take so much notice? Well, I, th- I suppose it's in the word wild, the fact that they are wild creatures and you're pitting your wits against something which is its ability to survive against nature and this is a wonderful opportunity to put your ability there to a test. But apart from that, I think the trout, and particularly wild trout, are such uh, beautiful creatures. And uh, also, so often you find you're fishing in some of the most beautiful places on this planet, not only in our own country, but other places I've fished, like, say, the Rocky Mountains or down in the Falklands or in, in the Alps and so on. So they do take you to beautiful places. I think the other thing I would point I would make is that trout fishing for me is a, is a very visual sport in that let me try to explain by giving an indication what I think would be the ideal day's trout fishing. And that would be going to a lovely river in a beautiful place. Hopefully, after an hour or so, some flies would start to hatch and then the fish would start rising to them. Then you would identify a rising fish, the fly it was taking tie on a fly which you would tie yourself, present it, you hope, competently to the fish, and then it'll come up and take the fly and you hook it. Now, that is the ideal, and let me tell you straight off, as any fisherman will know, that you've got to be lucky to get even a a small percentage of those in your day, because there will be days when it's dull and the fish aren't rising and you've got to go down deep after them and all sorts of things, but that's the ideal that you strive for. And if you do hit that, and you do from time to time, then it's a wonderful experience. From personal experience of wild trout, particularly up in Cumbria, where I like to fish at locations such as Red Tarn at the base of Helvellyn, which is the highest altitude water in England to contain fish, brown trout can be both easy or very demanding fish to catch, depending, of course, on your approach. Offer them baits on the bottom, and they will usually fall over themselves to oblige. But put a fly into or onto the water, and you could remain fishless all day. Presumably that also applies at lower altitudes, and even down here in Devon where we are today. So being a wild trout angler, and dare I say a purist, for you is it the chase rather than the kill that is paramount? I haven't knowingly killed a wild trout in decades, probably 30 years. It is, as you say, the chase and deceiving the fish. And um, I suppose this brings us on to this whole concept, which is so argumentative at times, uh, of uh, catch and release. Sadly, some people make a bit of a fetish out of this, but as far as I'm concerned, returning, releasing fish in the river is really a management tool. It's not some sort of blind faith that you have. I think it was summed up many years ago by Lee Wolf, a very famous American angler, who said that a wild trout is just too valuable to be caught once. And that about sums it up. It's all about conservation. There are only so many wild trout in our rivers, and we all have to do whatever we can to make sure 
that they, apart from moving on to environmental matters, that we don't skin the rivers alive. So to borrow a well-used phrase, does size really matter? And does the perception held by many that wild fish are, on the whole, always going to be small usually hold true? Because as you and I both know, that need not always be the case. No, I think the size of any fish depends on the environment it's in. If you're in a very lean, acid water like up on the moors, then the fish are going to be usually a bit on the small side, and I suppose uh, you'll be very happy to top your day's catch with a 10 or 12 inch fish. Having said that, my local moorland fishing up on Dartmoor, on the upper Dart, can produce occasionally a surprisingly large fish. Many, many years ago up there, the best fish I ever had was one of 20 inches weighing 3 pounds. Now you say, well, how on earth does a fish in those lean waters grow up to that size? The answer was quite simple. It had two 6-inch trout inside it. So cannibalism comes into the picture here. But uh, there are many rich rivers where, of course, the fish do grow to a large size. I suppose a classic example in the south of England would be the chalk streams. But equally, I mean, when I've been farther afield, things like tailwater fisheries in the United States, which can, these are rivers running below reservoirs at a constant temperature, where the fish are extraordinary size. But uh, I think you've raised an interesting thing with this matter of size, and perhaps I can give you an example of this. My first trout fishing was when Chew Valley Lake in Somerset opened back in 1957 for trout fishing. I was very fortunate that my grandparents lived there, so I was able to go and stay there whenever I felt like it. And in the first year, I recall, that I didn't have a trout under three pounds. Now, that could really almost have spoiled me for life. But when I came back to and and moved on to uh, river fishing and catching fish more likely to be 10 or 12 inches... You make the instant adjustment to this, and you accept them for what they are. So it's all a matter of proportion of enjoying whatever the fish are in the conditions where you're fishing. Before getting into the tactical and environmental side of your interest, which we will explore fully in due course, can we first go right back in time to your formative years? How did you first become interested in wild trout, and what path did that enthusiasm then follow? Yes, well, I was born in Cheltenham in Gloucestershire 76 years ago, but my very first experiences of fishing, if you can call it that, would have been during the war when I was living on my grandfather's farm in Somerset, and I would go down to the local brook, lift the stones and catch bullheads. That would be the first fish I ever contact, and probably sticklebacks as well. And then during childhood holidays by the sea, my father would take me out on the hour-long mackerel fishing trip in a boat, which are available in just about every seaside resort. But my first serious fishing came when I left school at 16, still living at Cheltenham, and a friend of mine suggested that we go and fish for roach and other coarse fish on the Avon at Tewkesbury. So we cycled the eight miles there and fished on the quay at the local flour mill, where the the boats would bring the uh, grain in. In that very first day, I remember, some splendid roach, probably some of them were pushing a pound. Didn't realise that roach weren't normally that, that easy to catch. And uh, this was by an outfall from the uh, the mill where the grain came out. And, of course, these fish congregated there, and they were very easy to catch. But that was my first experience of coarse fishing with a float and a maggot. Tewkesbury was a wonderful place to start uh, fishing because it's where the Avon joins the Severn. And you have this wonderful sense of seasonality to the fishing. These days, as you know, so many waters can provide carp fishing throughout the year. But then carp was something you fish for in the summer. But uh, when I was fishing at Tewkesbury back in those youthful days, I would start in the spring with fishing for something that most people never fish for, the Twait Shad. We had a wonderful run of these on the Severn, and I had a, access to a boat on the big weir, Tewkesbury Weir on the Severn. And these things thronged up the river in May in, in huge numbers. You could catch 50 and 60 a day. And I should say 50 or 60 and release that many a day because you wouldn't want to murder these poor fish. They were superb fighting fish, jumped all over the place, and a real introduction to a species which was so hard fighting. And then when the season opened on the 16th of June, we would start normally uh, using elvers for bait because you could go and pick up the silkweed on the weir and the elvers would still be there for about the first three or four weeks of the season and you put these on long trotting tackle and get out of the boat underneath the weir sill and trot this down and get chub and perch and then when the elvers vanished you would then start silkweed fishing for the roach and get very good roach on the silkweed and as summer progressed into autumn we would spin for pike 
and pick up at the same time Perch and Chubb while spinning. And so the cycle went into the winter when it would be ledgering with cheese for Chubb. And then through much of the winter, I would be concentrating on pike fishing on the Avon. So that's where it all got started. But one day, and I suppose I was about um, 17 at the time, I was walking across the the bridge over the Avon to walk across the big field called the Ham to Tewkesbury Weir. And there I saw a chap standing in the shallows at the tail of the weir, casting a fly. He was catching dace and the odd chub, and had a chat with him, and I realised this is something I wanted to do. So that was where my fly fishing started. Fortunately, in Cheltenham, the tackle shop was uh, run by a wonderful old guy called Harry Seeley, who in the pre-war days had been a tournament caster. And he saw I was interested and gave me tuition in fly casting in the alley beside his shop. He sold me a rod, of course, and uh, it took off from there. How much emphasis, then, do you put on watercraft, and in particular specific recognition in terms of identification and lifestyle of the various invertebrates a water can suddenly throw up, to the extent that prey switching to a specific hatch can, and very often will, take place? That came quite a bit later, because when I started fly fishing, I realised that there were trout streams out there, and I wanted to move on from just catching chub and dace, which is what I started with, to catching trout. Now, living in Cheltenham, as I did, right on the edge of the Cotswolds, you'd have thought, well, with all of those wonderful limestone rivers on the Cotswolds, I would be in a great position. But, of course, for a young angler, the chances of fishing those streams were practically nil. They were also restricted and private. So, once I had access to a car, I tended to drive west, down towards Wales and the Welsh border country, to fish rivers like the Usk and the Wide Tributaries, and that's where I could find more fishing. And that's where I got to know about trout fishing and I suppose there was a mix of fishing there on the Usk it was a wonderful river still is and I still remember my first days on the Usk the very first time I went down there I got down to the water and after a while the the flotillas these dark flies came drifting down which later knew to be large dark olives and the fish started rising and fortunately I had something was a reasonable reproduction in my box and I had half a dozen lovely wild trout. And I think that was the moment it really kicked off on the us. But some of the other rivers there did not have such prolific hatches, and there you do have to start learning about reading water and knowing where to cast your fly. And I mean, really, the only way to learn that is by experience. And there are some obvious spots that you can see where you should cast your fly, but experience is what it's all about. Anyone who opens up the fly tying pages of a trout fishing magazine cannot fail to notice the emphasis placed on perfection in designing and tying up artificial patterns. How necessary is it, in truth, to be so precise when fly tying? Must an imitation be a perfect replica, or can a more general generic pattern do the same job? Well, first of all, I'm not a perfectionist. Even if I'm trying an imitation of a specific insect, I, I tend to try to characterise it rather than do a precise imitation. Some people do magnificent imitations of flies. They almost look like the real thing. But I, I've never attempted to do that. I do a much more, almost a characteristic approach of it, trying just to get the main features of the fly, but with materials that can do what you want to do. In other words, float and are durable. It's no good having the most perfect imitation if the whole thing falls apart the first time a trout takes it. But that's okay if you're on a great water where there are great hatches and you're imitating the insects that are hatching. Sadly, we've all seen declines in insect hatches over the years and it seems to be a continuing decline. So a lot of the time you've got to fish when nothing much is rising and then you use generic patterns. I suppose the classic example of a generic pattern is the clink hammer, which has become almost universal in its use these days. But flies like the clink hammer, an elk, hair caddis, those are the sort of things that uh, I use so much of the time. But of course, we tend to be talking about dry fly fishing here, but let's face it, much of the time the fish are feeding down below, and then that means nymph fishing. And I suppose the great revolution in nymph fishing over recent years or relatively recent years has been the use of bead heads and i suppose at the beginning of the season now so many of us use little gold heads perhaps a, a, a hare's ear gold head or a pheasant tail gold head and this does give you a great opportunity to get down to the fish at a time when they're still especially in the early weeks of the season hovering near the bottom because our season in the southwest here starts on the 15th of march 
And usually you're fishing down below probably for the first three weeks before the fish begin to come up for any flies that are hatching. If some of these fly tyres feel such a need for perfection in terms of exact imitation, how do they then explain away the very obvious presence of the hook? That's a good question to which I have no answer, and that is why I always take a, a more general approach to my fly tying and do not try to go for this absolute perfection, because, let's face it, we can't achieve perfection. The only thing that's perfect is the natural insect, so you might as well accept our shortcomings and uh, just go for something that triggers off the interest in the fish. Therefore, you hope rise to your fly. From my own point of view, the ability to identify freshwater inverts while it may not be necessary down to species level for fly tying, is something I feel that fly fishermen should enjoy for its own sake anyway. I think that's even more important than just the business of catching fish, is that one of the wonderful reasons for going trout fishing, apart from the fact that you're in lovely places, is it does involve you in so much more. When you're wading up a river, you'd somehow get involved in the whole thing, the bird life that's going on around you, and the insects, which up on the bank can often seem a bit remote to you, uh, it's wonderful being down in the river and seeing them just drifting past you on the surface or lifting off the surface as they hatch. So it's all part of the experience, which turns just catching fish into an overall experience. And that, so I think for that reason, it's, well, it's just part of human curiosity. If you see something, you see these insects hatching all the time, it's natural, it seems to me, to want to know what they are which species they are, which families they're in, and so on. Now, besides being a hands-on angler, you're also involved to varying extents behind the scenes. As mentioned earlier, there's the Wild Trout Trust. But you also have, and still do, work with a number of game fishing magazines, and let's not forget your book, The Pursuit of Wild Trout. So how and why did the progression from a growing interest in fly fishing for trout to actively being involved in the instructional and political side of things come about? I suppose I got involved in aspects of fishing other than playing catching fish many years ago when I was in my 20s and a member of the Cheltenham Angling Club, a course fishing club, and I was invited onto the committee. And that's where it really all started getting involved in organisations and thinking more broadly about fishing. The um, Wild Trout Trust, which you mentioned, came much, much later. And this started really in, I think, 1996 when a small group of us got together and met over at Tolpuddle of all places, famous for its martyrs, and uh, we realised that a lot needed to be done for maintaining the habitat of wild trout and, where possible, enhancing it. And as a result of that, we decided, as human beings do, form an organisation. And we decided to call it the Wild Trout Trust, and we launched it the following year, uh, 1997. Actually, we launched it as the Wild Trout Society, but we decided early on that charitable status was the thing to go for. And a year later, we got that and changed our name to the Wild Trout Trust. I was its first chairman, which I did for my three-year term, and then I followed on uh, after that with about another five years as a trustee of it. And I think it's was one of the most exciting things I ever did because we've seen things grow from there and develop because um, our trout streams do really need looking after and uh, I think we've taken things forward and achieved a lot in, in the, what is it, 15 years or so since we got things going. What range of problems did the Trust face with back then which so urgently needed putting right? One of the first things we did was to produce a little booklet called Guidelines for the Management of Wild Trout Waters. And we tried in a very small leaflet to show people just what the problems were. And we listed them quite simply as overgrazing, cattle getting into rivers, and therefore they eat all the weed in the rivers. The rivers tend to broaden out, become, become too shallow, provide habitat for trout. Afforestation, and, and particularly coniferous afforestation, which results in acidification. So that is a little bit of a tough one for an organization like ours to handle. Overshading. We all want shadow on our rivers, but if you get too much of it, it goes dark in there. And remember, light is life. And you end up without having any weed in the water or any of the low growth along the banks, which gets shaded out. And therefore, of course, there's nowhere for the invertebrates to live, which feed the fish. So by tree management, you can deal with that. The results of dredging, because we've seen that on so many rivers, not on the horrific scale you see in Ireland that they did back in the 60s, but it's still being done, straightening out rivers, and that can be tackled as well. 
abstraction, that's more a political matter, but uh, it is something we live with, poor water quality and so on. So the sort of things we came up with and worked on and encouraged other people to work on was fencing rivers to keep cattle out where possible. And it's extraordinary just how quick the payoff from that can be. Back in the early days, I can remember one little river in Dorset, which was fenced off after being pounded to pieces by cattle getting in there. In no time at all, the bankside growth had come back. The river was beginning to narrow down naturally so that the flow came back into it. The invertebrate life improved. And within a couple of years, I think there was something like a five- or six-fold increase in the number of trout being produced in that river. So you get a very quick payoff with fish if you get the conditions right. Where you've had water thinned out by dredging, we often tackled this or encourage other people to tackle it by staking in trees and narrowing the river down, getting it back to the pool riffle sequence which a river needs, rather than just one straight canal-like stretch of dull water. Putting woody debris in is another one, because although often you can argue that some trees in the river can do more good than they can shading out above, because it creates cover in the water, it puts energy back into the river, creates habitat for food forms and so on. So that's only a mere sample of the sort of things we've been involved in, but we found ways of encouraging people to do their own thing. From the word go, we were very well supported by a number of organisations, fishing organisations, whiskey distillers, all sorts of things like that. And, for example, we started a bursary whereby we could send experts along to a club water or an owner's water to advise them on how they could improve it. We could pay for this, a day's visit by an expert and a report to be written on with a way forward. Another way in which we put our sponsorship money to good use was in an annual competition which still continues for the best restoration enhancement project of the year. We have one class for professionals and another for amateurs. And every year we have this big event in which we present them with their awards. And this is really giving people the encouragement to get on with and do things. And how do you find farmers generally? I suppose that some will be less amenable to help than others. Also, what about clashes with the Environment Agency, both in terms of having to do the work that they should be doing and getting the necessary permissions to do it? Dealing with your first point first, farmers... I think we tend to find that if they see that you're doing something which is enhancing the fishing on their water, after all, it's enhancing the value of something they own. So perhaps there are exceptions, but on the whole, I think we and other organisations like ours, the Rivers Trust and so on, find that farmers tend to be very cooperative on these things. And the Environment Agency? Well, now, I was involved for many, many years on the Regional Fisheries Committee down here at the Environment Agency, and before that, the National Rivers Authority, which preceded it, and before that, the old river boards, or river authority. And uh, the sad thing I think we've seen is that the resources which come to them from government have just gone down and down and down and down, and now it is a sad shadow of what it was. When I first uh, went on the Regional Fisheries Committee of the uh, National Rivers Authority, the amount that was being made available then was pretty substantial, many millions, but uh, that has now been changed dramatically. And that is why I think the important thing now is what the uh, River Trusts have been doing. Uh, one of the very first, in fact, I think the first down here was the, the West Country Rivers Trust, which was created here by something called the South West Rivers Association. But now these have gone countrywide with trusts everywhere, and I think this reflects the need to provide an alternative when the resources for the Environment Agency are being hit so hard. The Environment Agency actually was my pre-retirement employer, by the way. I was there right from the very start with the National Rivers Authority, a time when serious pollution incidents were commonplace. But by the time I retired, we had slowly but surely got on top of both agricultural as well as industrial pollution, to the point where it was exceedingly rare even to see a serious pollution incident at all, a mark of how effective the organisation actually was. There is that, yes. Where I think they now have problems is that um, with some of the enhancement work. I mean, for example, we fortunately just recently got a lot of money on the River Teen and the Dart and so on through DEFRA for improving the facilities for running migratory fish on our river. But that is being administered by the West Country Rivers Trust, not the agency, because they just haven't got the staff now, and that's the pity of it. Anyway, we digress. I don't think you've touched on the journalism yet. When I started work, I, I was working in an editorial office, and writing was part of that. So it's always been a natural thing uh, for me to write a bit. And I, over the years, thought it was 
I ought to start writing about fishing. But it was only when I got down here to Devon and started trout fishing that I really gave it serious thoughts. And uh, I've been um, writing ever since. Funnily enough, the very first article that I, feature article that I wrote was following a trip to Ireland to fish the River Shore. A magnificent river, lovely trout stream with great hatches and great rises. And I came back and I'd been fishing with an American friend and I got some good pictures. This was back in the 1960s. And uh, I put together an article and I sent it off to Trout and Salmon back in the days when Jack Thorndike was the editor. And he came back to me and said, look, I'm terribly sorry. I've just agreed to take an article from someone else who's visited the shore. He said, your article is far better. So he said, it really hurts me to return yours. But next time you produce an article, send it to me. And I sent it immediately to another uh, journal. I think it was Fishing, which was around at that time. And uh, they used it immediately. And that was my f- first article that was published back in the late 60s. But soon after that, I started writing for Trout and Salmon. And although I've written for many other magazines over the years, that was the one I've written most articles for and continue to do so on a fairly regular basis. But as I wrote more and more articles, I began to think, well, perhaps I ought to... Um, do a book sometime. It's a natural thing for anyone who writes to do. But every time I was about ready to get down to it, someone came along to me and asked for a contribution to a book. The first one was the Hague Book of British Trout Fishing, which I did the West Country section for. Uh, and then uh, Anne Bosbach did her uh, West Country Fly Fishing, and I did the Moorland Fishing section for that. Uh, and then Peter Lapsley was putting together the new edition of the Complete Fly Fisher, and he asked me to do the rain-fed section in that, so I did that. So that put it all back. But then, must have been about 1989 or 90, I think it was, one day when I was in the office, I had a call from a chap called Merlin Unwin with Unwin Hyman Books, and he said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, well, yes, I have, but it's a question of finding the time to get round to it. Well, he said, well, can I encourage you? He said, next time you're in London, come by to the office, which was, uh, was in the Soho area, I think, of Unwin Hyman Books, and let's talk about it. So I did the next time I was up on business. Uh, this was tourism business, which was my day job at that time. I went and had lunch with Merlin, and we discussed it, and as a result of that, he said, well, put up a synopsis, I'll put it at the next board meeting. So I put up the synopsis, sent it off to him, went to the board meeting, and the next thing I had was a contract and a down payment. And then I made a start writing it, and putting in the pictures and all the flies that had to be tied and so on, and I realized I hadn't heard from Merlin for a while. And then one day he rang up and said, have you heard? He said, I said, no. And I said, well, we, we let our shares slip below 50%, the family shares, and the, the other shareholders have been bought out by the Murdoch Empire. And he said, but your contract is firm with them, and they're quite happy to go out and publish. And I thought, well, I'd rather have the personal approach I've been uh, getting all along. And then Merlin told me that he was setting up his own publishing house, Merlin Unwin Books, and moving to Ludlow to get away from London to do it there. And he said, I can't break your contract because you have a contract with them. But if you do decide to, I'd be happy to publish your book. So uh, I parted company amicably with the Murdoch Empire and a couple of days later, I had a new contract from Merlin and a, a replacement for the down payment that I'd returned. And off we went. The only snag was, he said, well, this is fine, but I'm going to launch the company. This was November time, next July, at the Game Fair. And I'm planning two books. One is yours, and the other is Peter O'Reilly's new Fishing on Irish Rivers, uh, or Salmon and Trout Rivers in Ireland, rather. And he said, that means that I would like your, what was 50,000 words, in the new year, straight after the new year holiday. Uh, And I'd only written about a quarter by that time. And I said, fine, fine. And uh, what happened was that over that Christmas, I took some spare holiday I had between the two weekends, Christmas and the new year, and we spent it with me in one room scribbling and my wife in the other room typing, because that was before I had the computer and all that stuff. Well, I now typed my article straight onto a computer. And we got the words out. And I, on the day after the new year, sent them off to Merlin a few days later, he came down in a blizzard to look at my photo library, and we selected all the pictures, and he decided when he saw them that rather than the usual clump of pictures in the middle of a book, he wanted them right the way through in colour, which we did. And duly, on, uh, in, in July that year, at, uh, wherever the game fair was, that year, we had a sand, or Merlin did, and he was there, and Peter O'Reilly and I were there signing books. We had a great time, and that's, his company has grown a lot since those days, back in, I think, 91 that was. 
And are there any current or future projects on your horizon? Well, as you get older, you slow down a bit, as you appreciate. But I'm doing quite a lot with the West Country Rivers Trust with their passport scheme, because I think these passport schemes are so important to provide access for fishermen, particularly trout streams. So I'm doing a lot there. and I'm one of their ambassadors, as they call them. I'm still very much involved in my local fishing club, the Upperteen Fishing Association, which is a salmon, sea trout and trout fishing association on the Dartmoor River, where we operate about 15 kilometres of fishing. I've been chairman there, would you believe, for 32 years now. I feel that I might be getting a bit close to my sell by date, but the club uh, don't seem to feel that. I'm also involved in the Teen Fisheries Association, where I'm a committee member. This is the organisation for the whole river, which works with the Environment Agency and the West Country Rivers Trust and other organisations to enhance the environment of our whole river. You sometimes feel you're a committee animal if you're not careful. I'm involved on a committee of the Southwest Lakes Trust, which is the trust, which is a branch of the water company down here and operates the fishing and, indeed, other facilities on all the reservoirs in Devon and Cornwall. So I'm still very much involved, but I've tried to cut things back a little bit. You've got to slow down sometime. We spoke earlier, before the recorder was switched on, about genetic plasticity of brown trout. And while you don't see ferrets in this part of the country, you most certainly enjoy good runs of sea trout. So with the British Record Fish Committee listing both sea trout and brown trout as separate inclusions, what are your thoughts on that particular topic? Wonderful fish, because of course... The sea trout is the same species as the brown trout. And when you think about it, it's a rather splendid survival method because you could have a circumstance where you have both sea trout and brown trout, the two variations of them, where there could be a wipeout in the river of the brown trout, but the batch of sea trout are still out at sea there, and when that pollution is gone, they come back in, they could repopulate the river. Similarly, something could hit the run of sea trout, in a certain year, but you've still got the brown trout in the river, say, and they can produce more progeny because up to a certain size, when they're very small, there's no distinction. But at some stage, and I don't think anyone truly knows what this, they know we're all trying to find out, a decision is taken, if that's not too strong a word for a simple animal, whether to stay in the river or push off to sea. It's a very intriguing species, and but on the question of sea trout. I don't fish for them so much these days, but I, when I first came to Devon, I participate in that very Devon pastime of night fishing for, with a fly for sea trout. And they are superb fish. And uh, on the club of which I'm chairman, many of our members are fanatical sea trout fishermen who will go out there in the dead of night and some of them will fish right the way through. But um, it's something I'm not doing so much these days, probably old age. You talk of a decision being taken by the fish at an early age, whether or not to leave the river or stay. Is that fixed when it happens, or is it reversible in the sense that if either the sea trout run or the resident brown trout population was wiped out, the surviving branch still has the potential to reseed the other? Or does sea trout always breed true? One would suspect that they can, because it does seem to be a total variable. They can go either way. But uh, no one that I've heard of yet has told us quite what triggers it. But it is an intriguing fact that a fish can go in two such different directions and come up with just different animals at the end of it. Would it be fair to say that without intervention, what many might see as wild trout in a wild environment would be a mere shadow of what we have today, were it not for organisations such as the Wild Trout Trust? And for that, we should be grateful. Or, on the other hand... Are these fish and locations actually as wild as nostalgia might have us wanting to believe? I would rather doubt if it would have any impact on the genetic integrity. I can't see how it would have any impact. I think that restoration and enhancement work should really be bringing back what nature gave us in the first place. Uh, These techniques uh, uh, like uh, restoring riffles and pools by artificial work are only taking things back to what they were. Putting um, woody debris in rivers is only necessary, possibly, because we're also just a tidy lot and tended to clear things out in the past. By nature, f- trees fell into rivers and uh, gave us the woody debris naturally. So I don't think there's any conflict at all there. What we're doing is trying to bring back what nature would have given us in the first place. Stocking with bought in fish almost guarantees a loss of specific genetic integrity. Then again... Is specific genetic integrity that important anyway to maintain in the first place? 
Well, you brought up one of the great discussion points in fishery management here. And I'm not sure if we really know the answer on this. A lot of people pontificate on genetic purity, but I'm not sure they know that much more than I do. For a starting point, let's say this, that the genetic purity in most areas has been compromised over the years. Um, even here in Devon, where we think of uh, our rivers as being very natural, stocking of trout has taken place on all of the major river systems down here. So at some stage, that genetic purity has been lost. The other thing is, in some cases, where restocking has become necessary for a whole host of reasons, attempts have been made to maintain the gene pool of the river by setting up dedicated hatching facilities from fish obtained from that river. I must say that down here anyway, the, the record there is not very good. It's proved terribly, terribly difficult. First of all, getting the brood stock and then bringing them on. If you're going to stock fish, we have to face the fact it's much easier to get them from a hatchery. Now, you could say, well, could the hatcheries get, bring in the fish from the rivers? I know from speaking to hatchery managers, they do not like bringing in fish from local rivers because of fear of bringing in various diseases with them. They want to have very much their controlled stock. The other thing that crops up is where stocking has happened or still goes on, what impact it could have on the genetic strain that's still there. Well, this may be a somewhat academic answer because so much stocking on rivers now with brown trout is done with triploid, sterile fish, so they're not going to breed anyway. And as I've mentioned that there's probably been some genetic compromises made by stocking in the past, it may not be such an important matter as we sometimes think, but you can argue this one endlessly, and indeed we do. Genetic integrity, as I understand it, is most importantly expressed phenotypically in terms of adaptation to a specific piece of water, which with restoration work and accelerated natural change due to weather patterns these days, can see indigenous fish unable to adapt quickly enough. So are efforts in that regard not wasted anyway? Well, yes, I'm afraid the conditions are changing all the time. The fact that we as a species, I'm talking about human beings now, are increasing in numbers all the time means that those changes are going to continue, and sadly uh, it's very difficult to avoid that. Nevertheless, efforts are being made on some of our river systems. A case in point would be up on the um, upper Dart system on Dartmoor, where you've got lots of different tributaries. And I think they're beginning through some very detailed scientific work, which is way beyond my pay grade, to identify these very localized populations on uh, different streams. In the same way as on some of the major salmon river systems, they've identified individual groups of fish that come from specific tributaries and so on. Of course, you've brought up this matter of genetic integrity. It's not just trout. It's also salmon. For Even down here in Devon, way back, salmon were brought down from Scotland to try to improve the strain. And in more recent years, where it's been necessary through a collapse of the run in a certain river, some have been moved from one river, Par or, or Fry, to another river. So a lot has gone on over the years. You are best known as a wild trout enthusiast. With that in mind, how do you then react to situations where rainbow trout escape from holding facilities, and as can happen, successfully find themselves able to reproduce and establish self-sustaining populations, which then to all intents and purposes also become wild fish? Well, down here I'm not aware of any escapee rainbows that have set up a wild population. I think it's fairly unlikely, I'll tell you why that it's now well over a century since uh, rainbows were brought over from the States. And uh, I feel that, well, first of all, most of, so many of the rainbows now are triploids, even for stocking into reservoirs, they are triploids, so they're not going to breed anyway. And even if they were fertile fish, I think there's so many generations away from the wild that they probably wouldn't know how to do it. I think as far as they are concerned, sexual reproduction involves being picked up by a human being and stripped. So I've no knowledge down here anyway of a population which has developed that way. Now, where the few, very few examples of wild population in uh, this country, for example, Derbyshire is a case in point, I suspect that was from stocking way, way, way back when they were not so far f from uh, the wild. I caught some tiny half-pound rainbows from a lake in Yorkshire one time, the name of which escapes me. And I know for a fact that the scour pool at the head of the River Hodder in Lancashire, immediately below the dam wall of Stocked Reservoir, 
has or had a small breeding population of rainbow trout, and several others are also dotted around the country. So it can happen, and these are in the same way as the grey squirrel and the signal crayfish, now established as being native to the UK. Or would you prefer to see them electrofished out? I don't think it's what I think, it's what probably the salmon fishery interests think about this, and I'm sure they would do that. I'm in the fortunate position of having travelled a bit for my fishing, and I think that the rainbow, wild rainbow, is a magnificent fish. I've caught, well, in this country, the only place I've caught what I've known to be wild rainbows is on the Derbyshire Wye, but in the Rockies, I've had some splendid fishing for wild rainbows, and that they are superb fish. Although what we catch on our reservoirs are lovely fish, hard fighting, they have lost the spotting and the coloration of what they should be when you see them in wild places. We would like to think, those of us who fish a brown trout, that they are very supercilious fish which can drive us mad at times when they become very selective in their feeding. But I think some of the most selective fish I've ever seen are, are rainbow trout in a wild context on some of the rivers that I fished in America. and They can drive you mad at times. I've worked over fish for half an hour. I think that so many people's view of rainbows is coloured by what they catch, which are fish which are many generations domesticated. Now, as I said earlier, the explosion in small stillwater put and take trout fisheries, plus the opening up of the larger reservoirs, has been pivotal in the development of mass exposure to rainbow trout fishing. Has that come at a cost of wild brown trout fishing, or is it incidental to it? I find it an advantage in some ways, because we've only got so many trout streams. We can't create them anymore. There are no new ones coming along, so it's a finite resource. So I think the fact that uh, trout fishing is provided on this huge number of reservoirs, lakes, and particularly the small put-and-take fisheries, means that they're now within easy reach of just about anyone, even the biggest city, And it does take the pressure off of our natural trout streams. It's also the fact it does bring people into our sport and get them interested in trout fishing. And I find that a lot of the people who join the clubs that I'm a member of or approach me as someone who writes about fishing and asks for advice, they have been fishing probably for years on on reservoirs and small put-and-take fisheries. And while they still do it, as I do, they're looking for something a bit different. So uh, I don't see any conflict at all there. It could also be that more still waters allow individual open access, whereas streams and rivers require more lengthy and potentially complicated access procedures to be followed to get to fish them. Unlike put-and-take fisheries, you just can't decide to go on the day. Well, now perhaps you can with the passport scheme that you mentioned earlier. Going back a bit further, I mean, I I touched on the the fact earlier on that um, when I was a young angler in Cheltenham on the edge of the Cotswolds, I couldn't fish locally because the waters were all private and not available. So I think it is terribly important that fishing is more readily available. And one of the things that's attracted me to Ireland for fishing trips and for North America is the ready availability of fishing. I mean, if you go and fish on some of the very best trout streams in the world in the Rockies, all you have to do is go and buy your non-resident fishing license and you take off and you fish. And not being able to do that, naturally, is a sort of barrier. I mean, some young anglers are fortunate to have parents who are members of local fishing clubs and introduce them in that way. But we, it can be difficult. Down here, my local fishing club, which is the Upper Teen Fishing Association, we have a long tradition, going back many decades, of making fishing for trout available Anyone who turns up, we have about half a dozen local agents who sell day tickets, no limit on them. You can go and fish on about 15 kilometres of river just like that. The Duchy of Cornwall is one of the best examples in the country with countless miles of fishing up on Dartmoor, which anyone can fish at any time for trout. But there is this problem, and that is why these new angling passports are, I think, so important in the future of uh, making fishing available. It started, I'm pleased to say, down here in the West Country with our own West Country Rivers Trust back in 2000. In fact, the first passport scheme that they set up was called Angling 2000. This was a spin-off with their environmental work with farmers when they realised there were so many small streams which farmers had which just weren't being fished at times and no one had access to them. So they set this up and it's grown from there. At the moment, the current... Guide has about 30, 35 beats in it all over 
Devon and Cornwall and even into Dorset and Somerset. And all you have to do is buy a book of tokens, and when you get to the fishery, you put as many tokens as is specified in the guide into the box. The tokens are £2.50, so that's if it's a three-token fishery, you put uh, three tokens in the box, that's £7.50 for your day's fishing. So it gives you a wonderful freedom to wander around. And this is spread like wildfire. There's now the Wyos Foundation do it, and there's one up uh, on Eden, and they're all over the country now. So it, it is changing the scene and making fishing more and more available to more and more people, especially young anglers who want to do some trout fishing and don't know where to go. Would I be right in thinking that the ultimate day out for a wild trout fisher such as yourself would be to get on a productive chalk stream in perfect river-level conditions and clarity with an indigenous PB sat in front of you? Well, certainly one of them, yes. But uh, let's face it, even in these more enlightened age, it's not easy to find fishing on a top chalk stream. And if you do, it's going to cost you quite a bit. But uh, yes, um, chalk streams are wonderful places. Uh, the clarity, being able to see fish in the water. Even if there's nothing rising, you can sight fish for them with a nymph, for example. So yes, but there are many other waters that bring uh, you that type of fishing. I mentioned way back that my first trout fishing on a river was on the Usk. Now, there's a big rain-fed river, but you can get some wonderful hatches on a river like that, and the fish come up, and there they are rising, you can cast a fly to them. I mean, on some of my tiny little streams uh, near where I live in, here in Devon, we get good hatches of mayfly, large dark olives, blue-winged olives, sedges, and so on. And if you hit them at the right time, you can get that sort of fishing. But yes, uh, I mean, I think that uh, a day on a really cracked chalk stream with everything going for you is one of life's great experiences. Can we now start to explore the tackle and tactics typically used for the type of fishing we're talking about here? Yes. I don't want to generalise too much, but I, I do tend to use two rods for fishing on the Devon rivers. On the more open and bigger rivers, I use an eight and a half footer, and on the narrow rivers, I use a seven footer, simply because anything much longer than that, you probably hit the far bank when you were side casting. Now, lines are important, and on, with the eight and a half foot rod, I would normally use a four line in most conditions. I find it's delicate, presents the fly well, but will still cast into a breeze, especially uh, with superb modern tackle carbon rods and so on you can use much lighter lines than you ever could in the past i will sometimes use a five if there really is a force eight gale going but normally a eight and a half rod with a four line on the little streams again a four line possibly a three in the summer and uh, then attached to that for many many years i used a five foot braided butt to give you the drop down from the thick fly line to the tippet but a couple of years ago one of my tackle manufacturing friends, gave me some of the polycoated butts to try out. So I'm now, the last couple of years, I've been using a, a polycoated five-foot tapered butt, and then to that, or the old braided one if you wish, I attach maybe a 18 inches of slightly finer line, then taper it down to the, the tippet, which usually is, say, 5x, uh, maybe 6x in critical conditions in the summer. So it stays a step down rather than a tapered or straight leader. That's right, yes. As you'd appreciate, the point here is that a fly line is thick and you need something to bring you down from that thick line to the very fine line that you're using to tie the fly on. And it's that sort of tape that I use. But apart from having the braided butt, the rest of it I just adapt as I go along with bits of monofilament nylon on spools from my pocket to meet the needs of the day. And presumably that's a presentational thing. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, this is the point. That if you had your fly line and then you just tied on a, a strip of, say, three pound nylon, about nine foot long, you, you wouldn't be able to present. You, you want to, be able to put your fly down exactly where you want it, delicately, so you don't spook the fish before you even have a chance of catching it. Going back to the fly lines themselves for a moment, are these predominantly floating lines? Yes. On the river, I always use a floating line. If I'm fishing still water, different lines are used then but yes i use a floating line because if i want to get down to the fish i do this by weighting the fly either by the use of a bead head or by a lead underbody what about the contents of your fly box far more than i'm ever going to need uh, i've got boxes and boxes and boxes of flies around the place and uh, if you really think about it there are probably no more than about half a dozen flies that you need in a season and you could probably catch just as many fish as you do with the boxful. 
But the beauty of having a box of flies is this is brings in the entomological thing, that interest of seeing what's going on, trying to tie something to imitate it. So you tie far more than you're ever going to need. But if someone said to me, look, give me half a dozen or so flies for the season, uh, I would say, well, start off the season, you could do with two flies, a gold head, hair's ear, and a gold hair, pheasant tail, probably in on our rivers down here about size 14. And early in the season, when you're fishing with that method, I would I always like to hedge my bets because some fish will be looking up even in the very beginning of the season. So I fish with two flies then, and on the dropper, I would normally have a clink hammer with an orange post on it so that you can see it clearly. So then you've got the river covered you know, up on the top and down below as well. Later in the season, if one of the patterns I use to suggest specific insects are the hairsier sparkle duns which is an american design many years ago which i've been using for years and years and years they've got the ingredients that i'm looking for in a dry fly the hair means that it floats well it's very durable uh, i mean i've had 30 fish in a session on the same fly i don't mean the same pattern the same actual fly and it still come back for more and above all it catches fish because if it doesn't do that you're wasting your time so that's a great pattern, the sparkle done, I find. When sedges are on the water, a uh, hairwing caddis works well. Another fly I've been using a lot in the last few years is the CDC and elk, which is a, a, originated by a Dutchman, Hans Weidemann, I think. And that is a great pattern in all sorts of conditions. It's one of those great generic patterns, doesn't matter whether it's uh, upwing flies or caddis that are coming off, it, it seems to work. Another caddis uh, pattern, which is a great fly, is the elk hair caddis, which you can use almost in almost any conditions. So um, there's half a dozen flies. I'm sure I could catch just as many fish as uh, I catch now uh, with just those six. But I shall still continue to go around with boxes and boxes of flies and just enjoy making selections from them. And looking back over your time in Devon, what for you has been your best West Country memory? I, I used to fish, still fish from time to time, but I used to fish a lot because I lived over there for a while in the Calm Valley on a river called the Calm, which is a tributary of the X. And uh, although it's, um, it's still a rain-fed stream, it has many of the attributes of a, um, of a chalk stream. It has a fairly steady flow, it has good hatches of fly and good hatches of fish. And I remember one day, back around Mayfly time, I think it was, quite a few years ago, when the fish were just coming all the time. I mean, you couldn't miss them. And it was just one of those wonderful days when the weather was right and the flies were hatching and the fish were rising. And I realised I'd been got up to well over 30 fish. And it suddenly occurred to me it was my 42nd birthday, so I pressed on until I had 42 fish. So I always remember that, the 42 fish on my 42nd birthday. But there, of course, there have been many, many other days on so many rivers down here because one of the great things about living in Devon is having so much varied trout fishing and indeed other kinds of fishing with an easy reach and getting away from your native west country were and for what would be your absolute dream scenario again i would come back to the fact that you want rising fish to give you the perfect day so you want to be on a water which has prolific hatches of fly and i must confess it is getting more and more difficult to find that now i think that the first great day I have ever had of fishing in a terrific rise was on the river shore back in the late 60s. I was fishing on the shore in Tipperary near the town of Turles and it was one of those mornings when suddenly the flies started hatching and they were small flies, they were two species, uh, pale waterers and iron blues, uh, which you'd imitate with about a size 18 fly. And I think there's something very special about fishing with tiny flies Big mayflies are great fun, but fishing with very small flies on fine tackle is one of the peaks of fly fishing. And that day, they must have kept going for about four hours, and I fished for about a mile, mile and a half upriver, and they just kept coming all the time. So that was a perfect day on a lovely Irish stream. Moving farther afield, the biggest hatch I've ever fished in was on a river called the Green River in Utah. It's a tailwater fishery coming out of a big dam, which means that the water temperature stays constant all year round. The fish grow very big. I think the average size of trout on that water is normally about 17 inches. So you can see it's a, it's a, it's a big fish water. And I was there one day when, again, very tiny flies. They were betis, 
which uh, there they call blueing dollies, but they're different and much smaller than our own blueing dollies. And they were coming down in millions. That in the space of a table, a metre wide, there would probably be 500 flies any one given time. And the fish were just up in pods, just taking constantly. This is one of the experiences which I suppose you just wait for all your life, that having that many fish in front of you. Of course, when fish are taking so many flies in such huge numbers as that, you begin to think to yourself, well, how are they going to take mine? It's a bit like trying to catch a cow in the middle of a field on a single blade of grass, really. But I think that the fact that your fly is a bit different uh, and maybe a bit bigger than the naturals coming down gives you an edge. They probably take it because it's different. It's about the only reason you would explain you catch anything on a day like that. But having said that, the best of the fishing was as the rise was developing and as it was declining. During the absolute peak, you were just flogging away and you were very lucky to touch anything. But uh, that sort of experience is something that lives with you all your life. Finally, getting back to the politics now, what does the future hold for our indigenous trout species? And what can or should be done to maybe enhance both its status and its survival? Well, one of the greatest problems, if not the greatest problem, is the amount of water coming down our rivers. Because, as human beings, more and more of us are putting greater and greater demands on the availability of water all the time. And that means that what we call wetted area tends to reduce all the time. And this is, for all the work that organisations like the West Country Rivers Trust or the Wild Trout Trust or Environment Agents or whoever can do, it is terribly difficult for us to combat that. So we have to live within that parameter what I would say is that organisations like those I've mentioned have just got to do their very best to make sure that we enhance our rivers in every way possible within the constraints of what is a limited amount of water coming down. And the sort of river bank work and in-river work that I've mentioned are to concentrate the flow of water so that we get the pool riffle sequence through which fish and the things they feed on demand are maintained as far as we can. The other big worry at the moment is alien species. We all know about the signal crayfish, which doesn't only get at the invertebrate life, but also attacks the banks of our rivers. And there are all sorts of other creatures have been getting into our rivers, so that needs to be kept on top of. But ultimately, anything to be done to maintain river flows is crucial. And where might reservoir building fit into the planning, either in terms of alleviating or exacerbating the problem? This is a two-edged sword, really, because building reservoirs can result in cutting off flow. And we all have our wars over compensation flows coming from our reservoirs. So uh, I think that that is a very, very difficult one to answer because it can, in some cases, it can maintain flows, but not in others. I think that the work that's being done, which is more important, by many organizations like the Rivers Trust is working with farmers to stop what they've done in the past to get water off the land and into the rivers in an instant, because that just results in flash flooding and then droughts as soon as the water's gone. And the sort of work that's been done of where they've tended in the past to dig out deep ditches between every field so the water rushes out, now they've been putting in barriers there so you get growth back in there, which filters the water. I mean, the classic example has been that the work that was done on the River Tamar when the West Country Rivers Trust got started on that sort of front all of this water was rushing in, siltation was getting in, and then the water was being having to be drawn out for the people of Plymouth at the bottom of the river, where they were having to spend more and more money on filtering out all of the silt that had got in. But bear in mind the fact that the silt that was coming in was the farmer's topsoil. They're crown jewels, in a way, for the family silver, for growing their crops on. So what has been found, I think, more and more, by working with farmers on things like contour ploughing and uh, stopping the, these deep interfield ditches, are uh, to the benefit of farmers, and more and more farmers are gradually beginning to understand this point. So it, it comes back to the point, really, of working with landowners, with farmers, fisheries interests, all working together to achieve what we all want. I was talking to Peter Arlott, who's the river keeper of the Aldermaston mill stretch of the River Kennet earlier this summer, and he was worrying that they might literally run out of water altogether. They're probably not having that problem now, what would 2012 turn out to be one of the wettest years on record. But prior to the rains coming, there were actually a number of small rivers in the Hampshire area that had quite literally run out of water already. So ensuring enough water to keep all potential users happy is an incredibly difficult circle to square. Well, square it they must, 
certainly if indigenous brown trout populations are to thrive. So many thanks then to Mike Weaver for making us all aware of this and other potential problems being faced and tackled by the Wild Trout Trust on behalf of the rest of us, and for Aquatic UK flora and fauna as a whole. 